So I'm Health and Wellbeing Coordinator at the Beanie. So the Beanie is a museum, an art gallery and a library in Canterbury uh, in the southeast of England. Um, we're closed at the moment, um, but we're still delivering things online uh, and that includes our health and wellbeing programme. So we've got a established health and wellbeing programme. So we've got regular groups um, for people with dementia, um, for people with visual impairments, um, people with mental health diagnosis, as well as the general public as well. And health and wellbeing forms a key part of our strategy um, for engagement with the public um, and also for working with staff as well. Um, it's one of our kind of key underpinning values. Um, and I am the health and wellbeing coordinator there. So my job uh, is to manage those projects and support the facilitators uh, and also look at accessibility and inclusion. Uh, as well as evaluating what we're doing and measuring what we're doing to make sure that we're we're doing what we hope we're doing, which is improving people's health and well-being. We're also the Culture Health and Wellbeing Alliance champion, Southeast Museums champion, um, which we're very proud of. Um, so that means so part of our responsibility for that is sharing um, our learning, sharing best practice, and supporting other museums to set up health and well-being programs in their own museums. Um, so that's us. So I've, I've interspersed uh, the presentation with photos of our health and wellbeing programme and our groups that have been happening at the Beanie when we were open, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what the Beanie looks like and what we get up to at the Beanie. And also I think at the moment with museums being closed um, and sort of a lot of questions about reopening, it's nice to have kind of some positive images of the good times. Um, Okay, so things we'll be covering. So we'll be covering why measure health and well-being. So why is it important to measure health and well-being? Um, we'll be looking at types of evaluation um, and types of evaluation tools as well. Um, and that will all be tied into examples of practice at the Beanie. So how we've used different types of evaluation and different tools at the Beanie. Um, also going to talk about common challenges and how to overcome them. Um, and I'll get more onto that later. Uh, and then a bit about what you're going to do with your evaluation. So once you've been through this process, you've got your tools, you've spoken to your participants, you've got all your numbers, then what do you do with that information? Okie doke. So why do we measure health and well-being in museums? So I'm not going to just straight read off the uh, slides, but it's to learn and learn from and develop our practice. So we want to know what we're doing, we want to know what's working, what's not working, and to evaluate the impact of what we're doing. So what is the outcome of the groups that we run? What is the effect that it's having on people and their lives? It's also very useful to identify gaps in services. So is from your evaluation, if it brings up areas that aren't being improved, is that something that can be worked on? Is that something that museums can help participate in? Um, it's also a really important part of contributing to the evidence base. Um, so it's Creativity and Wellbeing Week this week and Creativity, Culture, Arts for Wellbeing is a, a massive growing area of research at the moment and a growing area of practice. And a really important part of that is having evidence that what we do says what we say it's doing. Um, we all know that arts and culture is good for wellbeing, but we need to be able to prove that um, so that other people can learn from it and so that we can justify being funded and so we can actually demonstrate to not just funders and high up organisations, but to people that come into the museum. Um, it's also a very useful way of raising the profile of your organisation um, by demonstrating the impact that you have. And that, again, can be with funders, that can be with legislative bodies, that can also be in your own communities as well. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily connect that going to these places impacts their well-being. Um, it's also a really useful way to contribute to strategy development. So again, if you've got an idea of what you're doing and what's working, what's working really well, you can start embedding that in your strategy as, as part of the sort of wider organisational plan for how your museum, how your institution is going to move forward. Um, and part of that is demonstrating the value of your service. So what is it that you do as an institution that other people don't do or other people can't do? What is the unique thing about your organisation 
that makes you different, makes you unique. Um, and again, I've sort of touched on this, but it might be a requirement for funders and commissioners. And I think this is going to be kind of a growing area of proving uh, what we're doing in order to justify receiving funding, um, especially from public funding bodies. Um, so what is evaluation? Um, so here is a definition um, from UCL that I've used. So it's a critical examination of an activity or project involving collecting and analysing information about the activity in order to determine how successful it's been to improve its effectiveness and or to inform future programming decisions. So we know why we evaluate. So what is it that we're evaluating? So what is it that we actually need to look at? So the first thing that we need to look at is whether or not your activity, your project, your programme is meeting its objectives and aims. Um, so when you're designing it, you've got an idea of why you're running a project. Uh, it may be that you want to decrease anxiety. It may be that you want to decrease loneliness or address another health social issue. Um, and evaluation is a really key way of ensuring that you can, you've met that objective. Um, it's also a really good way of identifying any challenges of delivering the project. So evaluation doesn't have to be 100% positive um, and only good things. It can also be a really useful way of bringing up what challenges are. And that is a positive thing because it means that you can, you can make changes uh, and you've got some evidence to argue for making changes too. Um, evaluation also shows us if the, if the project is cost effective um, and this is particularly useful if you're using tools that are comparable because then you can compare how cost effective your museum based project is versus a medical intervention such as medication or this, a similar project delivered in a different environment um, and what the cost to you as an organisation is and what the wider cost as well to the community is. Um, it's also really useful for identifying any unexpected outcomes and these will come out um, um, and that includes negative ones again. Um, also that doesn't have to be necessarily a bad thing to come up with negative outcomes. It's, it's all part of a learning experience um, and ultimately what the benefits were for, for the participants in the project. So what did they get out of it? Did they get improved self-esteem? Did they make friends? Did they feel better about themselves? Have they found it easier to manage their pain or to manage their long-term conditions? Um, so one question that I get a lot is when to evaluate, um, especially if you're, if you're just sort of coming into using health and wellbeing practice um, in your organisation, it's when to start it. And my answer to that would always be in the planning stages. So whenever you start planning a new project, a new exhibition, whatever it is you want to run, in the planning stages, you need to embed evaluation in that. So evaluating where your target group is at the moment. Um, and also in the planning, you need to embed that evaluation is going to be a part of the process. So it's not an, it's not an additional thing that you add on to what you're already doing. It's something that's an integral part of what you're doing. Um, so a baseline measure is basically at the beginning, before they've participated in your project, how do your participants, how do your volunteers, how do your facilitators feel at that point? Where is their health at, at that point? Where's their well-being at before you've started anything? And that's a really important one because that is where you're going to go back and compare later on whether what you did have had a positive effect, a negative effect or no effect. You need that baseline measure. Um, Midway evaluations and reports can be very useful as well, um, especially if you're running kind of long term projects um, and that gives you an opportunity to adjust what you're doing. So if you do an evaluation halfway through and you realise that you're not quite having the impact that you would hope for or not having the impact that you wanted, um, that gives you an opportunity to reflect and think about is it the group? Is it something that needs to be changed in the way that you're managing the group? Or is it something about the evaluation method that isn't picking up what it is you want to measure? Um, so that's a really useful, it's, it, it's a really useful thing to do because it mean it makes the process a lot more dynamic. Um, and at the end point, um, so identify the end point in your planning. Uh, so whether that be 
the end of the, the sessions that you're running, or it might be that you want to measure the impact of a group over the course of a specific amount of time, identify that in the planning. And then that last point um, is also a really good point, time to evaluate. And that's when you can gather the evidence and compare it to your baseline measure. Um, Post-project evaluation is also very useful um, because that shows the kind of long-term impacts um, that your project has had on participants. And it's something that can get forgotten uh, generally because uh, funding and projects tend to be kind of neatly wrapped up with a start point and an end point and there's not a lot of consideration goes into what happens kind of years down the line. Um, but I've done some evaluation and been a participant in some evaluation that's taken place sort of years after groups have taken place. And actually it's a very kind of powerful tool because like everything, things ripple out. So the confidence that you've identified that someone's grown at the end of your project a year down the line that might mean that they now feel confident to go out on their own it might mean that they've made friends it might mean that they've improved their employability options um, so there's a lot of wider kind of um, benefits that you can identify um, by going back to projects that you've already evaluated and seeing where those people are now likewise if those people their well-being has gone down um, since the project, then that demonstrates that the project was having a positive impact. So is it something that you could look into running again? Um, so there's lots of different types of evaluation um, and they're all very kind of big words and it gets a bit sort of researchy and techy. Um, so I'll go into them in more kind of simple terms. So quantitative evaluation is basically sort of numbers, statistics, uh, standardised measures uh, of evaluating things. So that can be measuring numbers of people that come to your uh, groups. It can be rating scales where people rate their well-being. Um, qualitative evaluation is more about kind of gathering stories. So that can be things like diaries, can be things like interviews. I will go more into these. Um, there's also creative approaches to evaluation. So if you're running art projects, if you're running creative projects, the, the artwork that participants make can be an evaluation in and of itself as well. Exhibitions can be a, a, a type of evaluation. Um, and economic evaluation looks very much at kind of the, the financial impact that um, your project has. So I'll just go into each of those in a little bit more detail and give you some examples of each type. Um, so quantitative evaluation tools. Um, so the one that is widely used in museums uh, is the Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. Um, and that's the one that's recommended by the Culture and Culture Health and Wellbeing Alliance. It's also one that gets used widely in NHS services, in social services and other um, sort of third party organisations. So that's a very popular one to use um, for that because you can create kind of com comparable um, data from that. Um, and I'll show you an example of that soon. Um, there's also visual analog scales, um, which is it's an observation based uh, scale, but it gives you a, a numerical sort of measurable outcome. Um, the arts observation scale has been specifically designed for performance based um, interventions. And that, again, is, is an observation scale that's done by a facilitator or an independent evaluator. Um, Likert scales, I'm sure you've come across in day-to-day -day life, that's a uh, rate whether you like something, one being not at all, ten being absolutely. Um, and again, that gives you some nice kind of number data that you can compare between participants, um, between points in a project. Um, and then there's the wellbeing measures umbrellas, which were developed by uh, UCL um, as part of their health and well-being in museums projects. So this is the Warwick and Edinburgh mental well-being scale. Um, so as you can see you've got um, 14 statements there um, and then so the participants fill it out themselves um, and they rate themselves uh, on how much they agree with their statements. So the first one is I've been feeling optimistic about the future um, and then they rate whether that's none of the time, rarely, some of the time, often or all of the time. Um, and, then, and, then, and then they go through the, the rest of the 14 questions and then you've, you've got a document there that's got 
if you apply numbers to those, um, then you can compare one at the beginning of the project and one at the end of the project and see if, they're, if they've changed the way that they rate themselves. Um, the, good, the good thing about this is it gives the, the power to the, the participants. As it's about their perception of how they're feeling. It's not um, how we decide that they feel. They get to choose how they feel um, and rate themselves. Um, the downside of this um, is that it can, like, it can be quite long and people can find it a, a bit of a barrier. Um, the upside is there is a shortened version of this called the SWEM webs, um, which is only seven questions long. Um, so if you've got people that maybe might struggle with filling in 14 questions and find it a bit of a burden, there is a shortened version. Um, this is an example of a visual analogue scale. So this one is for measuring pain. Um, it's quite a common one that's used in hospitals. Um, and this can be used either by an evaluator, um, so you can observe people, um, or by a carer, or it can be done by the participant themselves. Um, again, the advantage of that is that they get to control their own kind of narrative of how they're feeling. Um, and again, this is something that you could do at the beginning of an intervention at the end of an intervention. Um, so the example here is about pain, but this could be, it could be any other mood. It could be different uh, moods. It could be, uh, it, could, it could basically be anything that you want, depending on what your project is. Um, the arts observation scale is quite similar to, it is a visual analog scale of sorts, but it goes into a bit more depth and it's not about sort of a specific condition or a specific symptom as such. It's more about um, how you perceive their mood to be. Um, so this was developed with sort of performance based interventions in mind, um, but it could be adapted for use with other, other uh, types of project. Um, so it gives you sort of a, a scale of faces to look at and then picking a mood basically. Um, so this is something that um, people could fill out themselves. It could be adapted for people to fill out themselves. It's also very useful tool for carers to use for people that are caring um, for loved ones that may not necessarily be able to reflect on how they're feeling or may not want to talk about how they're feeling. Um, people that are close to them will know them, they'll know them best. Um, this is an example of a Likert scale, very simple one. Um, so how would you rate your experience with the singing group? Very bad, very good. Um, so you can make these as simple or as complex as you want them to be. Um, in my experience, generally, the, the easier it is to fill out, the more likely you are to have people feel happy to, to fill in evaluation forms. Um, the, the real benefit of Likert scales is you can make them, you can ask whatever question you need to ask. Um, you can be adapted for your institution, for your project. Um, as long as you're using the same questions at the beginning, at the midpoint at, and at the end and all your evaluation sort of points that you've identified, um, then it's a really good way of collecting kind of simple numerical feedback from participants. Um, the wellbeing measures umbrella. So this was developed by UCL specifically to be used in museums uh, and it's got two sides to it. So um, I put the link at the end of this presentation and I will send the slides out with all the links as well. Um, and you can download this in the measuring um, wellbeing museums toolkit. Um, and it's a double sided um, sort of tool and people can rate themselves on these 12 different kind of areas of well-being and their mood. Um, it's, so it's something that um, participants can fill out themselves. It's also that um, people can sort of make more of a conversation. So it doesn't have to be that they fill it out in isolation. It could be something that they do with the carer or the evaluator as well and talk about why, they're a, why they feel sort of a four on the distress scale and what it would take for them to feel less distressed. Um, and that's again a really, it's a very kind of colourful and simple way of people being able to track how they're feeling. Um, but if you do it at the beginning, do it at the end, you can see a change in those numbers and alter the shape that they make um, by filling that in. Um, so in terms of quantitative measures at the Beanie, so we use WEMWEBS, uh, which is the wellbeing scale um, with most of our groups. Um, so Power of the Object Group is a group that we run for people with dementia and their carers who are at risk of 
social isolation and loneliness um, and it's been running for a few years now it's very popular um, and in those sessions uh, the facilitator will get out our handling collection um, people are encouraged to sort of touch the objects in the museum um, and do creative activities it's also a very social thing a lot of cups of tea and biscuits and those sorts of things that are absolutely necessary um, and we've been doing WEMWEBS with them and what we've seen uh, with the WEMWEBS is over the course of a few years that well-being scale uh, that they've scored themselves has stayed the same um, which is actually a very positive thing because that goes against the national trend so the national trend is that people with dementia and their carers um, generally suffer quite a, a severe uh, decrease in well-being following diagnosis due to sort of a lack of support and the, the feelings of isolation and managing the condition so actually for uh, those participants well-being to stay the same is actually a very positive thing um, again the evaluation isn't about proving that you've kind of cured someone or you've made everything better it's 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 showing what you are doing so it doesn't always have to be fireworks and whistles and bells um, we've used a shortened version with uh, the Umbrella Centre, which is a mental health organisation in Canterbury, um, who did a number of sessions at the Beanie um, of object handling and creative sessions, and tours around the gallery. Um, and the results from that are this. So there's two columns. So there's the start. So this is their baseline measure. So this is what they reported their well-being as, be, as um, before they'd participated in any activities at the Beanie. Um, which was sort of to the low to middle kind of range and then at the end um, all the participants that were able to fill out um, at least two of the WEM, uh, so we use the shortened version, SWEM webs, uh, all of the participants that filled it out reported higher levels of well-being um, which worked out to be that each participant increased their well-being on an average of 24% um, and you can present it in graphs, you can come up with those nice percentages and that's really useful information um, to show further up the line to show kind of your funders and your managers uh, what it is that you're achieving. Um, so moving away from numbers and data and graphs and things for a minute, um, let's look at qualitative evaluation tools. So these are things like I said, things like interviews, things like focus groups, case studies, observations, diaries and journals so these are the more kind of conversational tools uh, where you will ask people open questions um, to understand what their experience of your project um, of your group has been um, interviews can be very powerful because uh, you, you certainly get that kind of the human experience and their narrative of what's changed um, for them personally um, this is, these are especially used, good tools for people that might find forms either difficult to fill in or they might just not want to fill in forms and they can be a barrier for some people or they might find it hard to express how they're feeling in kind of a numerical fashion it's quite it can be quite difficult um, for people to rate their mood on a scale um, from one to five um, people are a lot more complicated than that um, focus groups are a great way of evaluating projects um, and it's something that I would encourage sort of constantly um, so it's it's, um, it, it's up to you really when you run them um, before you set up a group is a perfect time because that helps you kind of establish what that, that group's needs are so it makes it makes what you're doing more relevant to them um, but certainly as you go through especially if you're having groups that run for kind of years and years on end it's good to get people's input into into the program and what their experience is um, so it becomes more of a kind of co-developed group rather than this top down we've made a group please attend and please get better it's it becomes more of a kind of conversation um, case studies are a great way of demonstrating like the, the power that a, a particular intervention has had on one person um, and this is something that we've done in videos um, before to sort of highlight someone's personal journey um, can be, again can be a very powerful tool um, observations so these can fall in kind of all categories but observations uh, are especially useful if you're running groups where carers and parents might attend um, if they've noticed that their 
their child feels more confident going to school and talking to other children or people might say about their partner that they used to be a lot quieter but now they're they're talking a bit more now they're doing the things that they used to do those little bits of feedback are just as important if not more important than the numbers um, because that is that's the real impact of what we're doing the numbers are very useful for demonstrating what we're doing but we want to know that what we're doing actually has an impact on people's lives um, things like diaries and journals you know, a great thing to use um, for people that struggle to talk about how they're feeling um, or would rather kind of have be uh, able to express that like in a more personal way um, away from museums and galleries and evaluators and program managers and all those people um, it gives them that agency over their own experience and how they're being evaluated because they're the ones that get to choose what they write um, so on the subject of diaries and journals so qualitative evaluation at the beanie so this photo is from a project uh, that we ran which was funded by the Esme Fairburn um, organization um, and it's a collections review which we ran with students that were identified as being at risk of anxiety in local universities um, and they um, basically they're helping us catalogue um, some artwork and prints that haven't been catalogued catalog previously um, the end that's going to develop their skills in um, sort of art handling um, and give them opportunities to learn so they've been linked up with um, art historians and learned a lot about what they're doing so we're aiming at developing their skills and as a result of that um, that it would hopefully have an impact on their anxiety as well positively so decrease their levels of anxiety um, and one way that we've been evaluating that is with diaries um, so um, here's, so, so pe people have consented to share this information so here's some quotes from um, diaries that people have been keeping as they go along at the Beanie um, and again I think these are really kind of powerful examples of the personal impact that you can have on someone's life um, with these interventions like I said graphs and numbers fantastic love them myself um, but this is what this is why we're doing what we're doing um, so these uh, these are really useful tools and they're also sort of therapeutic in themselves because you're giving that person the responsibility of kind of reflecting on how they feel and the impact that it has um, and we've seen we've had some really good outcomes from this project um, and we've also found a lot of artwork that we didn't realize we had some Henry Moore prints um, so in terms of getting creative evaluation so uh, this is sort of not quantitative, not qualitative, this is kind of other things that I was talking about, things like exhibitions and outputs from groups. Um, so creative methods of expression, so the visual arts or performance, music, singing, these things in themselves are things that you can use in your evaluation. They're things that you can put in your evaluation report. If you've run a group and the result of that is that people have made an exhibition, that in itself is part of your evaluation. That's a really positive thing that you've produced. Um, you can adapt quantitative measures too so you don't have to feel that these measures are very rigid unless you're kind of conducting a very scientific piece of research in which case you do but if this is something that you want to kind of test for your own evaluation as an organization um, you can adapt those measures and one way that's been done is so the, the multicolored umbrellas the um, well-being measure tool um, has been trialled on the floor so giant versions of that printed out and people will stand in the areas um, and have a conversation about how they're feeling rather than kind of filling it in as a form um, and considering so multimodal approaches basically means sort of mixed methods so do you want to do a scale and also do a video do you want to do a focus group and also do the web web so you don't you're not stuck with only being able to do one type of evaluation you can mix it up based on what your participants needs are how they're responding to the evaluation and what it is you need to get out of the evaluation what do you want to find out and what are the best tools for you being able to find that out um, so at the beanie some of the sort of creative evaluation techniques that we've used so um, participant exhibitions so this is a, an artwork from our art therapy group um, who put on an exhibition in the front room at the beanie um, 
and we've also made sort of a, a video, so a health and wellbeing documentary, um, where we interview sort of museum staff. We also interview um, facilitators and a lot of participants of the groups and carers of people in the groups. Um, and that in itself is not a scale. We can't make a graph out of a video, but that is a very strong piece of evidence um, of what we're doing. Um, and it's a really good way of evaluating what we're doing um, and of getting people to talk about the impact that it's had. Um, so just some kind of considerations for when you're evaluating. So always informed consent. So I, I think it's very important to be upfront about evaluation. We're asking a lot of people from people. We're asking them to talk about how they're feeling um, and to share that with us. That's quite a lot. Of, that's quite a big ask. Um, from someone that you might not know very well. Um, so I think it's very important to say why you're asking those questions. Um, so we're asking these questions because we want to find out if coming to this painting group improves people's well-being. So it would be helpful if you could fill this out or um, we're going to and explain as well what you're going to use it for. So this is going to be used for evaluation just at our museum or this is something that we want to publish. That's all part of informed consent. Um, I don't believe in kind of chucking forms at people and expecting them to fill them out. Um, they, they're doing something for us, so I think it's important that we're honest with them about what we're doing and why. Um, and generally, I found that people are more than happy to fill out um, kind of evaluations and take part in interviews and be part of the evaluation process once they understand what it is. It's not just because we are nosy and we just want to know how they're feeling. It's because we, we want them to be part of Sort of cutting edge research um, and to let us know their experiences, whether they be good or bad. Um, as ever, storing data, so thinking about kind of are you going to anonymize your results? Um, where are you going to keep them? Who's going to have access to them? When are you going to destroy them? And um, that all depends on your own organization's data protection kind of policies. Um, and considering who evaluates, um, I can't give you like a hard and fast answer on that one because it very much depends on your organisation. Some organisations are huge and have their own evaluation teams. Um, some are a couple of people, so one person is doing the role of sort of four or five um, different uh, roles. Um, you can get external evaluators if you feel that it's something that you really want to make a focus. Is That's really useful if you're doing kind of a piece of research that you want to get published. Um, it might be that you want to use the facilitator of that group to evaluate it. That has kind of pros and cons. Some, some groups have like a very established rapport with their facilitator, so they would rather do the evaluation with them because they feel they can be more open. Others might feel that actually because they've got such a good rapport with the facilitator, they'd rather not muddy the waters by talking about how they're feeling and they'd rather do it with someone else at the museum. And that's where it's really important to have a conversation with your participants about why you're measuring these things and why you're asking those questions, because then you can ask them who they would rather evaluate them, who they would rather give them the questionnaire or interview them. Um, yeah, and as ever considering vulnerability, especially if you're um, working with client groups that might have learning disabilities or might have kind of conditions that make them more vulnerable, um, making sure that they're aware of what they're participating in and what they're agreeing to, but also understanding the impact that evaluation can have on people. I think this very um, pertinent for conditions that are lifelong or degenerative, um, that if you're doing a lot of questionnaires about their health status um, and they don't see themselves getting better, then that might have a negative impact on their well-being. So you need to balance whether actually evaluation is going to have a negative impact on their well-being versus how useful that evaluation is going to be. And again, that's something that is there needs to be kind of a discussion um, with your participants and carers and facilitators. Um, and finally, yeah, co-creation of evaluation techniques. I think I, I think the best way to find out what people want is to ask them what they want. It's a lot easier than trying to guess. Um, and it gives the power back to them um, that I think the future of museums is a lot more about engagement and co-development and co-creation and getting people, communities involved in these institutions because we're there for the community. So it's only right that they get uh, input and 
have a say at every kind of stage of what we're doing. Um, so after you've done your evaluation, you've filled in your last report, you've sent it off, um, is what are you going to do with that information? Um, so I find it really useful to just reflect. So that's something that you can do kind of formally. There's a lot of kind of reflection cycles, or it might be just something that you want to spend kind of an hour thinking, or however long you take some time thinking about what happened, what was good, what was bad, how would you do it again? Um, and it can be really useful to write those things down as well if it's something that you're going to be doing on a regular basis to reflect on like, okay, what was good? What really worked then? What didn't work quite so well and how, why that might have been? Um, and that is really going to help you for planning things in future. Um, so consider the format that you're going to put your evaluation into. Are you going to produce a research paper from it? Um, or are you going to produce a leaflet that's going to be available for everyone? Um, that's something that you need to think about in planning, um, but again, after evaluation as well. So it's part of considering your audience. So who's going to be reading the evaluation? And it might be that you want to have sort of two different evaluation reports, one kind of very technical numbers, um, very complicated and in-depth for some um, people that are going to read it. And you might want a more kind of like leaflet informal or online kind of um, report that's for, for everyone to access. So and making sure that that's accessible for all audiences. So you might want to consider having an easy read version of your evaluation um, as well. Or if you're doing a video evaluation, having subtitles on it so that so people with hearing impairments can can understand what's going on as well. Um, which is all part of sort of considering the design. So do you want it to be a report? Do you want it to be a book? Do you want it to be a video, a web page? Um, I mean, first and foremost, do you want to make sure that at the very least the participants in that group are able to access and understand the evaluation? Um, so if you're running a group for people with learning disabilities, making sure there's an easy read version of it available afterwards. Um, and share it, share it widely. That's why we're doing it, is to say, like, this is what we do. This is the power of museums. This is the power of culture on people's health and well-being. The next thing we need to do is make sure that people are aware of it. Um, not only just for boasting, but of course, like, take your moment in the sun, but also so that we can demonstrate the value of what we're doing and that what we're doing is meaningful and it is powerful. Um, and it needs to be, it needs to be funded. It needs to be understood it needs to have greater sort of credence and kudos um, out there. Um, so some potential challenges uh, with evaluation. So choosing the wrong tool. Um, so this again comes down to considering who, who you are evaluating and what they're going to get out of that. So if you're asking children to fill out a 14 question WEM web, so that's probably not going to end well. So um, think about who your participants are and also think about what it is you're trying to measure so you only need to measure what it is you need to find out you don't need to measure everything so what is it that you want to find out and what tool helps best capture that and that's the tool that you need to be using um, this kind of evaluation bubble so this is something that happens across sectors internationally and this is silos of people doing fantastic work and never talking about it um, which is why it's so important to share what you find and to shout about it on social media, newspapers, wherever you can, whatever platform you can, so that you can start linking up with people that are doing similar work to you. Um, timing, so that timing relates to kind of when you do it. Um, so it can be very difficult, uh, well, not very difficult, kind of challenging to get um, evaluate a, a baseline measure, let's say, because you've only just met that group. So again, that's about how you approach it. So if you go in there and go, hi guys, can you fill out this form? Cheers. Um, you're going to get a lot worse reaction than if you go in and explain what it is you're doing, how long it's going to take, provide cups of tea. Um, also the amount of time that it takes to evaluate things. Um, short and sweet is the way. Um, if you're going for forms, the shorter they are, the more likely people are to want to fill them in. You don't want to make it a burden for people. Um, and sample sizes. This is generally important if you're trying to publish a piece of research. Um, 
if if you want to prove something, then you're going to need quite a large sample size. Um, so just be aware of of that, and also the kind of practical impl implications of if you've got a group of 50 people, that's going to take quite a long time to even kind of hand out two questions that you want them to answer. Um, evaluation burden. So I kind of touched on this. This is a lot about um, people feel like they have to respond in a particular way um, to your questions um, or they feel like they don't really want to fill it in that form but they think that if they don't then they're not going to be allowed to carry on coming to the group. Um, this is all about consent and co-production again so telling people this is what we're doing if you would like to fill in this form that's fantastic if not that's fine and there's no there's no problem if they do that so um, and the, that evaluation burden on participants can be whether it's questionnaires you're doing or it's interviews you're doing. So if you're talking to them about how they would best, how, how they would prefer to be asked about their experience, that can help relieve some of that because that gives them the power back. Um, inconsistent attendance is a frequent problem um, due to the nature of the people that attend groups and the nature of life in general. Um, and it's, it's just a challenge that it depends what you're doing and how you're evaluating. So um, I'm going to come on a bit to how to overcome this. Um, and inadequate time and resources. This is generally because it hasn't been planned into the project um, in the early stages. So that's something that you can overcome by getting it involved. As soon as you start planning your project, think about, OK, we want to run this group. Why do we run this group? OK, how are we going to prove? that we're doing what we say we want to do. So that needs to be involved right from the start so that you can delegate some time and some resources to it um, by recognising it, it's an integral part of the programme. So in terms of overcoming challenges at the Beanie, so for in inconsistent attendance, um, what we did with this is we, so we shortened uh, the WEM webs that we were using and did it um, every other time that they attended um, because the client group uh, due to their nature, uh, we're quite transient, so it, we didn't know, and they didn't know if they'd be able to attend in three months. Um, and that was something that was agreed with them that they were happy to fill out um, a wellbeing form every time they came um, because they didn't know when they'd be back or if they'd be back. Um, evaluation burden. So, uh, one way we overcome that is by always making it clear to participants that they don't have to fill out forms if they don't want to. Um, and for evaluating dementia patients, um, I touched on this briefly earlier about how um, people with long term conditions or degenerative conditions can find it quite difficult um, to report on their well being um, because they might not necessarily see it getting, they might not see it improving, and that, and that can have an impact on how they're feeling. So, one way we've managed this at the Beanie is we, we talk to their carers. Um, and their carers who are with them 24 hours a day have a very kind of in-depth knowledge of, of their partners and or the person that they're caring for. So they, they've helped us measure and observe the well-being of participants instead so that that participant can just focus on going to the group and having a nice time. Um, so yeah, so the key points are embed evaluation from the start. So as soon as you start planning a project, get it in them. Um, it should be participant centred and collaborative. They are the reason that museums exist. They are the reason that we run this project. So they should be involved in how we design evaluation techniques. And evaluating can be creative and fun. It doesn't have to be a 16 page questionnaire. It can be a video. It can be whatever you want it to be.